I'm, I'm, I'm relieved that Ambassador uh, Grandison has, has addressed some of the issues of, of Sedema that I was going to touch on later on in the presentation. Um, I just want to make a brief point about that before we start. I find perhaps in, in, in the region, particularly in, in, in the CARICOM region, Region that we quite often reinvent the wheel. I think what has happened recently, of course, all of us have been moved by uh, the disaster that has taken place in the region, and we, we get very frantic, and we um, we say, well, the governments are not responding as quickly as, as, as they can because we keep seeing these images on, on television. And then, uh, invariably, a group of us get together and say, you know, we've got to do something, without realizing that the infrastructure, the actual institutional infrastructure, is already in place. Um, not that I am blowing Caricom's trumpet, but quite often uh, the, these structures are in place and we are totally unaware of them as citizens. So we then start embarking in our very minute ways unstructured in trying to provide assistance when there actually is an entire framework which has been dedicated. There are people who um, spend their entire lives working out strategies and actually have strategies that, that, that can uh, uh, offer assistance in, in the circumstances, but of course the challenge, as Ambassador uh, Grandison said, is finance. The reality is that we all have extremely um, fragile economies, despite our graduation to upper middle income or however they define us, I would assume that after a hurricane your reclassification would put you at the bottom of the pile. So you should in theory become um, eligible. But the, the point perhaps that I'm, I'm trying to make is that we really need to look at the structures that are already in place. The, we need to inform ourselves and I certainly believe that the governments need to inform the citizenry of them so that we can get those to work rather than have the private sector jump in and start sending boats. Because Classic example, somebody said, like, you know, why don't we send pumpkins and, and, and uh, bora and rice and all these things. That's a great idea. It's, it's, it's a great gesture. The reality is when it arrives at the port, who's going to take it? How is it going to get this distributed? Uh, a lot of that is perishable. So if, if you already have a regional organization like Sedima, it's, it's really better to have everything feed into that. But that's just the point in that. And I thought that perhaps um, we should really address um, terms before we use them. Let me start perhaps in 1933, there was a convention on political asylum that really in theory defined what a refugee was and then the really big uh, conference on that came in 1951 when coming out of that there was a treaty and the issue about refugees has always been how do you define them. Originally, shortly after the Second, the Second World War, um, there were rather narrow definition or narrow word in the way we uh, perceive it today. And that definition in the 1951 treaty was, and I quote, owing to, we to well-founded fear of being persecuted for reasons of race, religion, nationality, membership of a particular social group, or political opinion, is outside of the outside of the country of his nationality or is unable or owing to such fear is unwilling to avail himself of the protection of that country or who not having a nationality or being outside the country of his former habitual residence as a result of such events is unable to or owing to such fear is unwilling to return to it. Of course, in 1951, everything was male gender, but that was the definition, essentially, it was you, you had to be prosecuted race, religion, or some sort of, of group. Then, in 1984, there was the Cartagena Declaration of Refugees that modified that definition, expanded it, I dare say, and it expanded it in, in these terms. Persons who have fled their country because their lives, safety, or freedom have been threatened by generalized violence, foreign aggression, internal conflicts, massive violation of human rights, or other circumstances which have seriously disturbed public order. That was a group of Latin American countries. The countries that actually signed on to the, that treaty, uh, the Cartagena Treaty, was they were Belize, Colombia, Costa Rica, El Salvador, Guatemala, Honduras, Mexico, Nicaragua, Panama, and Venezuela. And then in 2011, the UN Human Rights Committee itself expanded the definition further, and it said who, those a refugee was uh, defined as those who are outside of their country of nationality or habitual residence and unable to return there owing to serious and indiscriminate threats to life, physical integrity, or freedom resulting from generalized violence or events seriously disturbing public order. I. I refer to this because we 
and I'm addressing specifically uh, Venezuela here. Quite often we refer to the persons who are fleeing uh, Venezuela as refugees, and the term refugee quite often in those circumstances is misused, and what you really want is an economic they're defined as economic migrants because they're leaving the country due to bad economic conditions and not due to fear of persecution. So in the case of Venezuela, um, it may not technically be uh, refugees that, 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 that are leaving the country, but um, they certainly are people in difficult circumstances, and the question obviously arises, um, how do we treat with them? Um, it's interesting. Everybody who's trying to flee Venezuela is going every direction except east. And, and that's, that's, that speaks, that, that is a statement in itself. Um, I'm not quite sure, I, Northwest is not inundated. Trinidad certainly has benefited from a, a, a significant influx of highly qualified um, doctors and engineers who have um, fled Venezuela, particularly engineers in the oil industry who fled Venezuela, now seeking jobs in, in uh, Trinidad, and of course a lot try to get further north to Miami. What should Guyana's approach be? Well, I should rather say, what is our approach at the moment? I think Isabel's point that she made earlier that um, Guyana has had a history of, of being in similar circumstances, or our citizens have had a history of being in similar circumstances, as a basis for us not adopting that position. I, I would prefer to put it this way. I, I think Guyana, which has been blessed with the resources it has, compared to the rest of the Caribbean, um, really has no excuse for not having in place policies that will actually absorb these numbers and not impact upon our economic development plan. I think we've, we've had a history of a very, very progressive foreign relations through the 70s and 80s. Uh, we, um, we people were landing here on the way to uh, Southwest Africa to fight apartheid, and we, we've always been at the forefront of the thinking, uh, certainly in foreign relations. I, I find it difficult, certainly as um, what, second generation independence, uh, given the resources we have, and given the fact that we have so poorly mismanaged those resources, that we end up in a, a state of, of, I don't want to say panic, a state of concern, where we're worried about whether people from the Caribbean are coming to Guyana. We're 83,000 square miles. We have more natural resources, rare metals, we, we now discovered oil. Why is it that we are concerned that people are going to come in here. And I think we really have to put uh, the blame squarely at the door of ourselves as, not, as citizens not being able to create the economic framework that would actually create a demand for more persons to come in. I think the World Bank says to have, quote unquote, a real country, you have to be somewhere around four million. Now, I understand the political dimension in terms of voting, et cetera, et cetera, that, that follows from this, but that can be concerned, that can be addressed by the way of citizenship. So if, if you make it a little bit more difficult to become a citizen, then you don't have to, to sweat, quote unquote, uh, the persons that are coming in. But I, I certainly don't think that we have the human capacity at the moment to deal with the minuscule economy that we have now prior to oil. I think we certainly have very little skills to deal with um, how we're going to create the economy when we get oil and what we do with the revenues from it. And therefore, there can be no better time than now to begin to articul articulate a policy, developmental policy, which obviously will indeed create uh, space for persons that we are now calling quote-unquote refugees or persons who are interested in Ghana. I just want to share with you um, typically what would happen to a Venezuelan. So Venezuelan, would, very rarely, the ones that fly into Tumeri are the ones that are coming to buy goods and leave, like the Cubans. The ones that come into the Northwest, come down the Waini or come, come into Pomeroon, uh, th th those are the ones that, that, those are the areas in which people will perhaps uh, enter Guyana in case of refugees. I'll come to the Caribbean in a minute. Uh, typically what happens is that Venezuelans are obviously different looking than Guyanese. So they're not difficult to pick up if you're a police officer um, in an outpost somewhere in the Northwest. 
And invariably, the police officers in the Northwest have pressures that cause them to perhaps vary from their standard operating procedures of their required um, operations. So they would see uh, a Venezuelan, and of course, they will interact with the Venezuelan. And invariably, within the first five minutes of that conversation, uh, the Venezuelan has no documents, so it becomes an economic transaction as to whether he is allowed to stay there or he gets arrested or she gets arrested. Invariably, if they don't have the resources, which they probably won't, they will get arrested. Um, at some stage, he has to report upwards why he has these people here. So they then get transported to Ghana at the, sorry, to Georgetown at the expense of the state. They get to Georgetown, the officer in charge says, well, we don't know what we're going to do with them. Again, because there is no overall framework or policy coming from the central government. The central government has not said to the police officer, um, look, People who are coming from difficult countries that are in difficult economic circumstances, we are not going to be as aggressive in, in addressing them. So he has no policy framework. Thanks. He, he does what he knows to do, he charges. That person then appears before a magistrate who has no sentencing guideline, period. Not just for people who are here illegally. Magistrates have no sentencing guideline. That's why you will see in Guyana the disparity that you exist. So even for a citizen, if you turn up before Magistrate A, you could end up with a non-custodial sentence, and for another magistrate for precisely the same circumstances, you can end up with a period of up to five years. So there's no sentencing guideline, even for nationals. So when a foreigner comes to Ghana, depending on what that magistrate had for breakfast, whether or not a relative got uh, defrauded by a Venezuelan, their faith is literally in the hands of their magistrate and how they feel that doing, in the absence of guidelines. And of course, you get arbitrary decisions. Um, so they then, if there's an order for them to be deported, because it would make no sense to find them, because if they couldn't even pay the police officer in Northwest, they're not likely to be able to pay the fine in Georgetown, they then go into some absolute hellhole where they're kept in custody, and guess who has to pay for them and feed them while they're there? The state. So there are two, there are two principal levels at which this can be rectified. One is the immigration department, uh, the Ghana Police Force, needs to be given clear guidelines in relation to how they treat persons who come into the country who might be classified as people who come in as economic um, migrants or refugees in, in the general sense. And the state has to provide that guidance to the law enforcement agencies, immigration and police. Secondly, the commanders of the police station and the commission of police need to have uh, in place certain standard procedures where they can differentiate between somebody who is trafficking in narcotics or trafficking in, in humans and somebody who's a genuine refugee. I can't imagine it being very difficult to do that. Um, so that they sort out at that stage those who clearly are potentially criminal element from those that are genuine. And then when they get to court, if you decide to prosecute them, and I, I really think that that decision really should be a last resort because it has several implications. From, its, from the state's point of view, it's expensive because until the home state can afford to pay for them, Guyanese don't send them. So when we remand Sri Lankans and remand people from Nigeria, the home state invariably doesn't want to pay and they sit and wallow in circumstances, in effect, serve a sentence. But yes, three, when, when you come to the magistracy, there must be clear guidelines in relation to how you treat persons who are economic refugees, so that you don't end up with the disparity that exists, and that there are straight guidelines across the board and across the country because Georgetown's not the country. This, this needs to apply across the country. So whether you were processed in Anna Regina or whether you were processed up at Molson Creek, the same policy would take, take place. The same policy framework would, would exist. And that's part of the problem. No, As I, I believe that we have failed to articulate, and forgive me for perhaps being slightly repetitive, uh, an overall economic development strategy for the next 15 to 20 years that would clearly um, indicate how it is we would like to attract preferred skills into the economy to be able to transform Guyana. And my real fear is now that we are going to be getting revenues from oil, 
given the culture of dependency that we have, where we, we don't have a culture where we want to stand on our own two feet. We have a culture where we expect the government to do everything, which really is the exact opposite of what should be happening. When you pour money into that awful, combustible, social, degraded situation, we will now become literally fat, even more uncompetitive, and in those circumstances, I dare say, I think um, Guyana is going to be in even greater danger. Forget the vagaries in the, in, in the oil price. I, I think socially we'll become, in the absence of any sort of policy framework, we will become more vulnerable. Um, we will not recognize what will happen to the country. And in the absence of that policy, there will be I, I want to say involuntary migration into Ghana just as a result of the tangential jobs and opportunities that are created not in the oil industry but outside of the oil industry and when they're not regulated by the state we know what happens and given the weakness of our law enforcement agencies given the the absence of our institutional capacities, I, I believe that the humanitarian crisis in which we are attempting to offer help, or we should be attempting to offer help, we will probably end up in a position where we will probably need the help at a much higher level to be able to deal with it. That concludes my brief presentation. Thank you.